Gospels about the coming ministry of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, verses 15 to 17, he says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Later in verses 25 to 27, he says, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Later in chapter 16, 12 to 14, he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit our advocate. <clears throat> and other translations can help to convey the richness of this idea. Comforter, counselor, helper, one to befriend you. He encourages, supports, assists, and cares for us. He even pleads our cause. The Holy Spirit continues the ministry of Jesus, another advocate. Think about how Jesus ministered to his disciples during his earthly ministry. He patiently taught, cared for, encouraged, guided, corrected, and loved them. The Holy Spirit continues to do this. Let the Holy Spirit fill our praise today. And let's thank our good Father for sending the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, this divine helper, comforter, and advocate. And why don't you stand with us and we're going to sing to God. Let's go. 
Psalm 32, 5 says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Romans 3.23-24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus.
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweet.
Please be seated and let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, almighty and powerful God, King of Kings, receive our humble worship this morning. And we say we know you and thank you that you are so many things to us, Lord. You are so good. You are Savior. You're a refuge. You're a hiding place. You're our helper, our healer, our redeemer, our hope, our strength, and an anchor in difficult times. We thank you that you meet us when we need you, that you are with each one of us and that you are present, ever present to us. And so in the quiet of this moment, I just invite you to call out your need for the Lord and to open your heart to receive his presence. And we know and thank you, Father, that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we are tethered and firmly rooted and anchored in your great love. And we just hold out now and ask your encouragement for people in our congregation who are suffering and battling cancer, who are recovering from surgeries, who are affected in some way by mental health, who are battling uh, loneliness, or loss. Lord, I especially hold up our seniors to you this morning, the challenges of aging and the um, difficulties that COVID has presented, those that aren't able to come and be with us here in person. We just um, acknowledge and say we love them and ask your encouragement over them. Lord, it's often our need that brings us to you, but as we come, with our whole being into your holy presence, we also see and recognize our need to confess the ways that we have grieved your spirit. And so I just invite you to, to pause again and confess the way that you have not honored God in your thoughts, word, or deed this week. And Jesus, we thank you for your work on the cross. And Father, we thank you that you are standing with open arms, that when we sincerely confess and repent and turn to you, that you are just there waiting to embrace us. Thank you for the goodness, good news of that. And I do also just hold up anyone who feels that there's shame or unworthiness or chains that are keeping them from stepping into your embrace, Lord. Pray those would fall off, break off that there would be freedom to receive your generous love. And Father, there's brokenness in our own hearts, but there's so much brokenness in this world. We know that grieves your spirit. And we just especially hold up areas in the world uh, today that are enmeshed in armed conflict and vi where violence rules. I pray especially today for uh, the country of Ukraine and this impending um, uh, conflict there. We pray your peace, Lord. We pray reconciliation. We pray for you to make a way in that situation. And Father God, I just really feel impressed today to pray for a fresh filling of your spirit here at North Shore Alliance Church. I pray for an outpouring of your power into each of our lives and into our church, into our ministries. Father God, we want to see you, your work. We want to partner with you. We want to be filled in such a way that we move as you call us to move. We want to see that there's abundant fruit of the Spirit here that is so evident to the people that we come in contact with that they see in real time the transforming power of Jesus Christ in us and through us. And so come, Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us today. Give us hearts to receive you. Give us eyes and ears to see you, that we may be followers of Jesus in a way that allows your kingdom in heaven to come here on earth. We pray these things. I pray now just for Pastor Jeremy as he brings this, us your word to us through his preparation and his study. Open our hearts to receive what you'll have for each one of us this morning, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Preteens, follow Michelle. It's good advice in life. It's cool. Eventually, I'm going to learn to adjust the stand before I get up here. All right. I want us to begin right away with our scripture which is in John's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 35 to 31. Uh, and let's, um, I'm going to read this. It'll be on the screen for you now, and we'll go through this passage. Again the next day, that was a dog. Sorry, it's saying the dog wants to hear the scriptures as well. Sorry, um, again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So the passage gets us into the early days of Jesus' ministry. Uh, John's been baptizing people. They've been repenting, turning back in faith. And uh, some, Jesus shows up and he gets anointed by John. And some of John's followers leave John and begin to follow Jesus. And uh, it begins pretty much with a simple inquiry. Where are you staying? And he says, come and see. And this is about all it takes for people to begin following Jesus. And these are actually the first acts we see of testimony. Brother finds brother. Andrew goes and finds Simon Peter. And then Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. And Nathaniel has doubts. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Which is a bit like saying, can anything good come out of Surrey? I used to live in Wally, so I'm, I'm, I'm there. Like, it's, can anything good come out of here? It's kind of a backwater. What's going to happen here? It's, it's his expectations are coming up. And Philip says, come and see. Come check it out for yourself. But ironically, or interestingly enough, in this section, verses 46 to 51, it's Jesus who sees through Nathaniel, straight through to his heart. Here's an Israelite in whom nothing is false. And so Nathanael comes to see Jesus, but in fact, it's Jesus who sees through to Nathanael, and in that moment, Nathanael believes. Something clicks. So in this little snapshot moment from the beginning of John's gospel, face to face with Jesus, Nathanael's reasons dropped away. He had ideas about the value of Nazareth, and he had ideas about the value and criteria for prophets, where they ought to come from, but face to face with Jesus, none of those ideas mattered anymore. And in the the face-to-face moment, the testimony of Philip and Andrew and Simon was ratified. They said a thing, now I've seen it for myself. And I want to propose to you that the proper goal of all the evidences we look at is encounter. All the stuff we're looking at, all the ways we talk about Jesus and think about him, the proper goal of that, where we want to get, is with encounter. All the evidence we can give you for faith, all the things we can say about what we believe, all of it pales in comparison to an encounter with the Lord. Now, in its own way, this little story in the beginning of John's gospel is paradigmatic for the rest of John's gospel. When we get to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, she goes to tell the town. 
She has this meeting with Jesus. She runs off to the town to tell, and they come back and meet Jesus. And here's what they say, John 4, 42. It is no longer because of what you, the woman at the well, said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Testimony, word of mouth, was one thing. It was an important thing, but encounter was everything. We see the similar kind of thing at the great invitation at the end of John's gospel. Thomas, the doubting disciple who's poorly named, he asks good questions and get good answers. Thomas doesn't believe that Jesus has come back. He says, unless I put my finger in the hole in the hand and put my hand in his side, I won't believe this thing has happened. And so Jesus shows up and says, Thomas, stick your finger in, put your hand here, believe. Right? And his response, uh, he says, my Lord and my God. There's lots to say about that. I'm not going to say it now. But Jesus' response to Thomas is what matters for us. This is John chapter 20 and verse 29. Jesus says, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. In other words, at this moment in John's gospel, he turns from Thomas to you, the reader. Thomas, you got to see me and you've believed. Blessed more are you all who are reading this story and have believed even though you haven't had the chance to touch me and hold me and see me in this way. And so John's blessing turns to us. The value of testimony is really significant. And at the back of this is an overarching invitation rooted in the Old Testament that we see in a place like Psalm 34, verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. That's too important for me to say alone. Would you read those words with me right now? Ready? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. It's a pretty straightforward invitation. Taste, taste and see. It's not observe and speculate, right? It's not sample and ruminate. It's not hear and think. It's sink, taste, Put the teeth of your heart into the good news of God and see if this is really good news. Get it inside you. Get it deeply inside you. Chew on it. And then find out for yourself that God is all goodness and all perfection and that he answers the longing of our deepest desires. But you got to taste to find that out. Now, the Latins had a lovely word for this. They called it ruminatio, from which we get our word rumination. It's the word for a cow chewing grass, right? You know how cows' jaws work? They go like this, right? Sideways, some of you haven't seen many cows. They roll the food around in their mouths and they grind it up. And that's the invitation to us. Get God in you. And chew and let the saliva, I won't, let's not do this because we get to metaphors of forming cheese and I don't think that's where we want to go. Get it in you, taste and see. And this is the place where I've wanted us to land, our series on epiphanies. We've considered the magi who through their study of the natural world were led to worship Christ. We looked at the Ethiopian who through his study of scripture was led to worship Christ. We came back to the Magi, reflected on how God's truth throughout other religions was part of what led them to Christ. But the end of all their searching, the end of all their inquiries has always been Christ. For Dave's sake, I will quote from the prophet Bono. I've climbed the highest mountains. I've run through the fields. I've run, I've crawled, I've scaled these city walls only to be with you, but... Dave didn't know I was going to do that, so I'm really pleased. (laughs) You know what? The transforming experience of an encounter with Christ is the answer to all our searching, and it trumps all of our lesser knowings, and it fills in all the gaps that we have in our knowledge to come to that point. The evidence only gets us so far. Encounter with Jesus is what changes everything. So I've talked about this in the past with students at St. Andrews. I've had little talks with young students who are trying to figure out what they believe. And sometimes I've really met by mystified faces, a personal relationship with Jesus. What even would that look like? How, would that, how is that possible? What are you talking about? Well, I can tell you what it means in part. A relationship with Jesus is the difference between a notional faith and an integrated faith. A faith that's just information and a faith that fills every pore of your life. And the line we have to cross between the two is marked by this business of encounter. You've got to meet him somehow. 
Now, let me be perfectly explicit so there's no confusion. I want each and every one of you to encounter Jesus. I want you all to meet him. I want you to have that experience. I don't want you merely to know things about him. I don't want you to have a collection of facts in your head. I want you to hear and respond to the call of the psalmist to taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to know for yourself not because someone else told you. Now, I want us to do this for ourselves. I want us to do it individually, and I want us to do it as part of our mission to the North Shore. I want you to taste, and then I want you to be able to say to the Nathaniels who are in your life, come and see. Come and see. It's good. I want you to try it. So, big question. How do we encounter Jesus? How do we help other people encounter Jesus? And this gets us immediately to a problem isn't Jesus gone? Okay. Maybe this is right where you went. This is where I go. And this may seem to you an insurmountable problem. You may feel some disappointment. Nathaniel had an opportunity to meet Jesus in the flesh. What does encounter even look like when Jesus is, well, absent? Isn't the distance between Nathaniel's experience and ours simply too great? Well, we can come at this with some questions and answers. Now, a couple of brief notes. One, I'm about to throw a lot of scripture at you. Okay, just gonna, I told this to Liesl and she wrote back, she said splat. Right, so I'm about to just toss scripture at you. And that's okay, I think it's good for us. And second, and this is part of a kind of a pedagogical conviction, a teaching conviction. Um, I think that um, I, I'm always going to prefer to give you a paragraph of scripture rather than just a verse for the most part. Um, I think it's important that we see that the main set of ideas in the Bible is always in paragraphs. It's always the paragraph is containing the idea, and it's always inside. So there'll be a couple times I give you a verse, but for the most part, we're going to get some uh, bigger chunks and talk about them now. All right, so let's go through this now. Question number one is this. Where is Jesus right now? Where is Jesus right now? And the answer is, he ascended into heaven. Okay. Where is Jesus right now? He ascended into heaven. We read it in a passage like Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And so uh, this is Luke writing. It says, after he had said these things, after Jesus had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. These two men, probably angels, also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So um, there's some significant things here for us to talk about. It's an event called the Ascension. He ascends into heaven. It's kind of a funny moment. You see them like squinting into the cloud and then angels appear. Like they don't see the angels appear because they're busy looking up. Uh, and then the angels explain what's gone on. Um, heaven, as far as we understand, is probably not like spatial. Heaven probably isn't like up. That's not what this is about. Um, heaven is probably like some kind of sideways. Is, don't worry about that, but that's probably the better way to think about it. The reason he goes up into the clouds, the manner of his ascent, ports, points more importantly to the manner of his return. The angel says that. As you see him go, so he will return. And this is an echo of the book of Daniel, that one day you'll see the Ancient of Days coming on the clouds, right, with glory. He returns in full power and authority. So the ascension points to the manner of his return. Okay, all that being said, uh, we, get this, we get the language of the creed. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. All right, so where's Jesus? He ascended. Question two, what's he doing there? Okay, he ascended into heaven. What's he doing? And the answer is interceding on our behalf with the Father. He's interceding on our behalf with the Father. Now, for this, I'm going to read from you for the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 8, 1 to 6. For my money, Hebrews is the most difficult book in the Bible. I think it's just simply the most difficult book there. Um, I've spent a long time looking at it, reading it. It's still opaque to me. Uh, but one of my professors in St. Andrews, a guy named uh, uh, Moffat, um, he's gone through Hebrews, and he's done some of the most stunning work to explain what's going on with Hebrews that I've encountered. It's amazing, amazing to see some of the stuff he's pulled out. And one of the things he's talking about is that Hebrews is basically a lengthy sermon on the ascension of Jesus. Jesus has ascended, and here's what's going on. I was thinking about what's happening with, with Jesus now. Let me read you this passage, and I'll talk about a couple things from it. Hebrews 8, verses 1 to 6. Now, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest, Jesus, who has, been who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. 
For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For, see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern for which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained, this is Christ, has obtained a more excellent ministry by, by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on, a better, on better promises." Complex, but let me see if I can tease some of it out for you for a moment. You guys probably know a little bit about Hebrew sacrifice, that once a year, the high priest carries the blood of an innocent animal into the Holy of Holies and offers it as atonement for God's people. Innocence making people innocent. That's kind of the logic of sacrifice going on. The high priest does this on his behalf and on the behalf of the people. Now, verse 5, in this passage, the author of Hebrews has talked about that whole sacrificial system being a copy and a shadow. In other words, Jesus was the actual sacrifice and all the stuff in the Old Testament was, was, a, was the afterimage of what he did on the cross. It was all there to show us what was really going on when Jesus makes his intercession for us. And now Jesus, the ultimate high priest, the high priest to whom all high priests are supposed to point, is bringing his own innocent blood before the Father. Jesus makes a sacrifice. He's carrying his own blood before the Father. And what he's doing there is he's securing our salvation and sanctification, which are big words meaning that he makes it so that judgment passes over us. We are saved from judgment, and he makes it so that we are purified from, for God's presence. That his blood makes it so that we can live in the presence of God. And in this process, what Jesus is doing is praying for us, which is kind of cool. Where's Jesus right now? He's sitting at God's, he's sitting at God's right hand saying, um, my child Brad is here, right? And I... I've got, I've got concerns for him. Well, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> I care about him. My child Sarah is here. He's praying for you. Right? That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is busy praying for you to the Father. That's where Jesus went. King of kings and Lord of lords is busy interceding on your behalf. So, question three. How do we encounter him? If he's busy in the heavens doing this thing, how do we encounter him? Answer, through his Holy Spirit. We encounter through him through the Holy Spirit. John 16, verses 5 to 11. Uh, this is the upper room discourse. Jesus is hanging out with the disciples. He's about to go away. He's explaining what's happening to them. And here's what he says. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, I hope this is among the more straightforward of the passages we've looked at so far. I hope you can pretty much clearly see the logic. Jesus ascends, the Spirit comes down. And according to Jesus, the Jesus has ascended so that the Spirit could come down. This was the plan. This is what God had in mind. And effectively, the Holy Spirit has replaced the presence of Jesus on earth. Now the Spirit has replaced the presence of Jesus on earth. This is not the time to detail our entire theology of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, I've got plans to come back to the Holy Spirit sometime hopefully later this year, maybe after Easter. Uh, we can start to think about some of these things together. I'm not sure yet. I haven't made that plan. But I'm going to give you some key points about the theology of the Spirit. They won't be on the screen, and I'm afraid I'll go over them fairly quickly. So there's three of them. Number one, the Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus Christ. Where the Spirit is... That's where Jesus is, okay? That's part of our theology of the Spirit. Number two, when you believed, you received the Holy Spirit as a gift, a deposit, a seal of God's promises. This is very clear. The moment you believed, God puts his Spirit in you as a seal, a promise of the resurrection power of God, that this is landing in you. So God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, rests in you by faith, because of faith. And third, therefore, because the Spirit of Jesus is in every believer, Every Christian is a possible means of encountering Jesus. 
which might be a little bit alarming. But it's true that when people look at you and if you profess faith, they are in some senses encountering Jesus Christ in that moment. Now, this raises some questions, a sub-question, sorry, also not on the screen. Why doesn't the Spirit manifest in every believer in the same way? Uh, And there's a lot to say about this, but I really like the answer provided in some ways by this guy named F.B. Meyer. He was a British Baptist preacher. He's a contemporary of someone like D.L. Moody. Uh, He was influential in the Keswick revivals. If you've never learned about Keswick, it's unbelievably cool, some of the stuff that was going on. And he spent some time thinking about the Spirit, and like a good Baptist preacher, he came up with three uh, alliterative words, present, prominent, and preeminent. And I like this a lot. F.E. Meyer says, the Holy Spirit is present in every believer by means of faith. It's present in every single believer just by means of, of having believed. The Spirit is prominent in fewer believers. Where when you encounter them, the Spirit's presence, the presence of Jesus Christ leaps out at you from having encountered this person. But the Spirit is preeminent in very few believers. Where people encounter them and say, whoa. I've met something of God in this. The Spirit's present in all of you, prominent in some of us, preeminent in probably very few of us. And I think there's some um, pretty scary reasons for why we might not want the Spirit to be preeminent in us. We're going to get to those in a moment. Okay, question number four, getting out to this. We meet the Holy Spirit. This is how we encounter Jesus. Yeah, the question is, but how do we encounter him? Like, how do we make this encounter happen a little bit? Well, I've got an answer now in three parts. So ready? Answer part one, ask. You just got to ask for it. Uh, and this is wonderfully explicit. Luke chapter 11, verses 9 to 13. So I, Jesus, say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Some of you have heard that verse and thought it's just about prayer requests. It's not. It goes on. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, this is wonderfully straightforward. And it's one, as, a, as a dad, it makes perfect sense. My kids come to me and say, Dad, I would like a bowl of cereal. I don't pour them a bowl of rocks. Dad, I'd like pasta for dinner. I don't pour them a bowl of worms, although I joke about it sometimes. My kids ask for things, and I give them the best things I can because I love my kids. How much more will our Heavenly Father give His greatest gift, the Spirit, to anyone who asks Him? God doesn't mean to deny you any good thing that He can give. And the best thing He can give is Himself. So you ask, you're going to get. Because He wants to give this to you. He's eager to give it to you. But this comes with a part two to this answer. All right? So part two, how do we encounter him? Part two is we have to surrender to transformation. We have to surrender to transformation. Look again with me at John chapter 16, verse 8. We read this a minute ago. And he, the Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Well, the Holy Spirit is the light of God. He's the source of our epiphanies. He's the one that makes things go off for us. But light illuminates darkness. And when the light goes off in our hearts, it exposes the nasties that might be crawling around in there. I've lived in places where you turn on a light at night and cockroaches scurry around the corners. Sometimes the Holy Spirit goes off in our heart and you guys have some cockroaches in your heart. Well, we do, sorry, not you guys. We've got cockroaches inside us, don't we? And lizards and mice and things that are just not pleasant, scurrying around, fleeing the light of God's revelation. And asking for the Spirit means allowing the Spirit to do that illuminating work to convict us. And I want to suggest that some of us haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit precisely because we're afraid of what he will reveal when that happens. So this morning we sang the words, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And I think what happens is we want to feel the Spirit and we want the power of the Spirit, but we don't like the illumination of the Spirit. He's not quite so well. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, but not here. Okay? Just keep this, let's just put this over here, Holy Spirit. You don't have to look this way. I'm busy. So, part of this means surrendering to transformation. 
Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, lovely passage of Scripture, same kind of deal. Here Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. There's so many wonderful things to say about these verses. I'll just say two of them briefly. One is that if you are presenting your body as a living sacrifice, it has a habit of squirming off the altar. It just wants to get out of that position and surrenders an uncomfortable place to be. Second, uh, in here it says, uh, which is your spiritual service of worship. This is one of the greatest mistranslations in the history of Bible translation. The Greek word is logikain. It means logic or reason. It is your reasonable act of service. To offer yourself is the most reasonable thing you can do in light of how God has revealed himself. And this use of the word spiritual suggests that it's just this notional, ephemeral thing that doesn't really matter. No, God is asking you to make a reasonable choice in light of who he's revealed himself to you to be. Okay? And it's an act of surrender. And like I said, surrender may be the least popular word in the English language these days, but I believe that we will not be able to taste and see that the Lord is good unless we are willing to surrender to him, to the illuminating, filling power of the Spirit. An undeniable part of the Lordship of Christ is the business of allowing him to be Lord. And the Spirit is where he exercises that Lordship in our hearts. So I gave you part one of the answer was to ask, and part two of the answer was surrender to transformation, and the third part of the answer for how we get connected with the Spirit is to hang out with the church. Hang out with the church. Get around the people of God who are filled with the Spirit. Um, you know, each of us has the Spirit in us, but something seems to happen special when we get together all being filled with the Spirit, and we turn our attention to the Lord who's giving us the Spirit, and we ask in community, something happens. There's something powerful in being together in this respect. A couple passages I want to look at briefly. One is 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Uh, Paul is talking about a lot of things, immorality in particular, but he gets onto the spirit in this. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, this is great. The Spirit's living in you. You're a temple. And we could wrongly conclude that this meant that we should be uh, deeply individualist in this stuff. And Peter gives us a nice corrective. First Peter 2, uh, this is 4 and 5 and 9 and 10. And coming to him, that is Christ, as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But, Peter says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. One of the great changes between the Old and the New Testaments is that where the Holy Spirit rested on the temple in the Old Testament, now the Spirit rests upon the church in the New Testament. Where the temple was a building in Old Testament, the temple is now a body of people who are inhabited by that Spirit in the New Testament. And now we, by the Spirit, have become this light, illuminating the world. We're a city on a hill, and we are the place where the Spirit of Jesus Christ is revealed most clearly. We're the church. We're where he gets to show off. And so sometimes when people say, I haven't met Jesus, I think it's a fair question to ask, have you been to church? Not into the building of church. Have you been to the church where people together are worshiping in faith? In a minute, we're going to um, invite the Spirit in worship, and we're going to pray, and we're going to sing together. And I want to be clear about a couple of things. One is this, um, something special happens when we worship together. I don't know that I have reasons for it. I don't know that I can explain it. Something happens when we get together and we turn our attention to God, our Father. We worship Him, and something about the Spirit's presence just magnifies in worship. I Maybe the Holy Spirit just likes music, and that's okay. 
I think that's important for us. But there's some clarifications we need to make along the way. One is that we invite the Spirit, we don't manipulate the Spirit. We're not in control of this. And I'm afraid that sometimes there are bits of manipulation where, you know, we can use things like, we can, um, I'm not going to be too targeted here, we can use things like uh, key changes and crescendos and certain songs make you feel things more than other songs and we can try to um, piggyback on the emotions of music to make you think, yeah, no, that was the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. I mean, he can work through it. But the point is not to manipulate ourselves into a frenzy of emotional excitement. That's not it. Sometimes when the Spirit shows up, though, he gets busy and, and we, things happen in us. And we need to be ready to respond to those things. We are not in the business of manipulating you spiritually so that you'll feel a certain way. It's not, that's not what this is about. It really is about finding what God wants to do and surrendering to him. And at the same time, on the opposite of this, it, we are not in the business of elevating one kind of approach to Jesus above the other approaches. It's really not science versus encounter or scripture versus encounter or truth against encounter. It's the whole of our lives bringing us to that place where we can meet and encounter the King of Kings, Lord of Lords in worship. So I'm going to invite um, Tom and the team to come on up and get ready. And we're going to turn now to a time of praise and worship. We're going to exalt our Lord Jesus together. And we're going to do this to the glory of our, the Father and in the power of the Spirit. Please stand with us if you're able.
pray for you. I want to invite Debbie and Clive Harvey to come, and they're going to be leading anybody who needs prayer this morning. There they are. Cool. If you need prayer for anything, come and receive prayer. Uh, Come let them pray over you and ask you to be filled with the Spirit this morning. And in fact, uh, let me pray that for you right now. Holy Spirit, we have no idea, earthly idea, what you might want to do with us and how you might want to lead us and guide us. But what we do know is that you illuminate, you comfort, you convict, you lead, you fill us with your um, presence so that we can encounter our Lord. Help us this day to surrender in a fresh way to that spirit to be filled and empowered for the work you have in store for this place. So may the Spirit of the living God fall fresh on us to renew our minds, hearts, and souls so that we can bring living water to our thirsty world. These things I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.